Hello and welcome. My name is Carrie Varela of the Reiki Healing Society, and I feel so honored and joyful to be with Robin Logan of the International House of Reiki and Michaela Daystar of Heartscapes Reiki for another episode of Reiki Women. Um, today, we're going to be talking about a very interesting topic, and um, we're going to be diving deep into one of the precepts, being true to our, your way and your being, and um, kind of inter interlay that with the process of creativity and how Reiki um, helps us and supports us to be creative people, um, creative women. And so I'd love to hear from Michaela. Michaela, how do you connect with this precept, being true to your way? What's your story there? And how does it help you and support you in your creativity? Yeah, I um, being true to my way for me has always been really intri intricately linked with creativity and a process, a, an evolution from very kind of rigid and narrow um, thoughts and feelings about creativity uh, to something much more um, fluid, much more organic, something much more true to myself. And I think much more true to life and the, and the spark of humanity that we, that we all share. Um, I generally have identified as an artist most of my life and for um, you know, time early in life had aspirations of being a professional artist in some capacity and did some trainings around that and, and really, you know, was efforting to um, create a, a lifestyle around being an artist in some professional capacity. And that didn't happen. Um, I, I tried a lot of different kind of inroads to that, a lot of different ways of uh, seeking um, seeking kind of the approval of our culture around what it means to be creative, what it means to be an artist, um, realizing how narrow those definitions are, um, how narrowly we define who is allowed to express themselves as an artist and get recognized and celebrated for that. Um, and on the other side of that, how typical, how common it is for most of us, the average person, to have our creativity really shrunk down and denied or downplayed. Uh, many of us have had an experience, you know, early on in life where we've been expressing some creative aspect of ourself and been told that that's not right. You're not doing that right. That doesn't look right. Uh, it's not good enough. Um, and those kinds of messages stick with us. And as I have incorporated creativity more um, explicitly in my work with Reiki and with other um, forms of internal processing, I hear this story again and again. I'm not creative. I'm not artistic. Um, you know, I, I, but there's this longing for that. And it, it came home really clear to me when I read the book, The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. Um, she talks about the creativity wound that many of us walk around with. Um, the, you know, experience of being told that some, some way in which we're expressing our creative nature uh, is not right, is not good enough. And the way that we internalize that as meaning we as a human do not have a creative side. And we go through life with that belief and it harms us and it limits us. And it means that when we are truly in that creative spirit, in whatever endeavor we're having, we don't recognize it necessarily. We don't leverage it. And I really think that we as individuals and we as a community miss out um, quite a bit by doing that to ourselves and to each other. Um, because the, the reality is that we're inherently creative, that it's part of our, our being as a living creature, as a spirit, body, mind, heart integration, that we're inherently creative. We're inherently finding ways around difficulties, way, different ways of expressing things, different ways of solving problems, that we're inherently creative and that uh, we all have a birthright around expressing our creativity. And so, you know, this trajectory between like efforting to be an artist, feeling like a failure, feeling not good enough, you know, turning away from that, going into, you know, academic work and feeling really closed down around my creativity. And then little by little, allowing that side of myself to come into my work in unexpected ways, come into my life in unexpected ways has really been a huge part of my path to being true to myself, being true to my way, being true to my being and being true to our collective being as humans, 
um, and to really uphold that and uplift that in other people so that we can um, have full access to this capacity that's part of our birthright. Um, so for me, working with Reiki uh, has been a way of opening that up, but there's also been ways in which Reiki in and of itself is a form of creative energy. And maybe we'll circle back to that um, in this conversation. Um, but I'd love to hear what comes up for the two of you when you sit with the, the question around what does it mean to be true to yourself and what does it mean to express your creative nature? Or is that something that you've thought of? Is that is that something that you relate to? Yeah, well, I, I've always been, I've, I'm a bit like you in a way. I've always thought of myself as creative. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I bring it down to the very basic um existence in that every word every action so as I'm speaking now yeah as I'm moving my hands my body everything that I'm doing now is creative because it's not something that I've sat down plotted out thought about not that that wouldn't even be creative that's a different creative process but what I'm saying is it is something that is uh it comes from somewhere and it's not mm -hmm. something it's it's like an it's an active uh how do I say that it's like an active um, an active energy I guess and um and it's making something yeah so it's 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 making this discussion that we're having here it's putting together ideas as as we as we think I just I find it absolutely astounding that that everything that comes out of my mouth, for example, is just new in a sense, yeah? And yet, of course, there's always that thing that nothing is new because those words have all been used in some form before, but the way that I'm using them and the way that they're coming out is totally, um, yeah, for me, uh, creative and exciting. Um, and so it's interesting when people think that they may not be creative or, yeah, that's sort of what you were saying, Michaela, you know, that we we are constantly perpetually creating um so uh and and when i if i think of it in terms of uh in a more formal sense then i think uh being a business owner for example i've found incredibly creative uh i love the challenges of having to think of new ways of doing things um working around obstacles you know it's it is that same thing as as speaking in that you know whatever is whatever's happening in that moment working with that and and finding ways to to be uh to achieve the the best of whatever you want in that moment and uh being a business owner helps you with that so whether it be writing things marketing things um creating products whatever you know that that in those terms that's uh it's always creative, always interesting, always exciting. And perhaps we would all feel more creative if we remembered that everything that we're doing, you know, if we if we tapped into that mm, newness and excitement of the of everything that we do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking about from my perspective, but I think no matter what anyone is doing is probably a creative, has a, you know, has its um creative process. Um yeah. Um, what else did you just ask? Did you just ask something about Reiki as a creative energy? Yeah. So I was going to come back around to that too. So Reiki is a creative energy. I, uh, oh, well, you know, it is that thing that what we're working with is uh, you, you tapped into that just before we're working with that, the earth, the heavens, the heart, and when we're working with these energies, we're creating this wholeness and it's a wholeness that's not cluttered. It's actually a wholeness that is um, open and clean and clear and, and boundless. And it has that beautiful potential for uh, whatever is to come from that. I mean, we talk about, you know, the I and the ego and all those sort of things. And sometimes I think people think being creative is actually creating an I or creating an ego. But we could see it from a Reiki perspective as 
possibly almost the opposite of that. So we could see it as releasing the I, releasing the ego, and really just really sitting back into that, uh, that boundlessness and allowing potential to rise. So, um, yeah, I think I'll leave it with that for the moment and I'm sure someone else can take over and fly with it. Yeah, what comes well, up it's so, Yeah, it's so interesting to hear you guys speak because it mirrors so much my journey too and just so many little things. But for, for a long time, I, my business, I self-branded as Carrie Varela Healing Arts. And that was really my foray into, you know, claiming that identity as an artist for myself. And um, I'm not a traditional artist, like I don't paint and I don't um, write poetry and um, some other art, you know, that I actually deeply admire. I deeply admire people who can paint and write poetry. Um, but for me, you know, my teaching was always art and um uh, my Reiki practice was always uh, really tethered to creativity. And um, so, you know, for me, it always just came down to like a little spark of inspiration. There's just something that inspired me to like no end. And I could build a whole yoga class around it. I could build a whole workshop around it. Or it might be just this thought or inspiration that came to me in a Reiki training or um, working one-to-one -one with people in Reiki. And um, it became like, you know, my fuel for the week and um, connecting me again and again to a bigger picture, to a bigger truth, to, um, you know, a bigger life force. And so it's always just really, um, yeah, meaningful to connect with you all because I feel like we have had, like, you know, very diverse experiences within Reiki, but also very similar ones. But um, yeah, and then, you know, just being a business owner, I mean, I feel like I think I found my place and I found my, my, my way as a, a solo business owner because I always got really frustrated by any sort of bureaucratic process, like working in a traditional job. Like if I like had to like, you know, create something and then present it to five other people and have them kind of, you know, chew through it and roll it over or whatever. Like that whole process was just totally defeating and frustrating to me. So I like found this incredible joy and freedom and just being able to, like, I can just make something and I can just put it out there and it can be kind of this pure expression of whatever it is that I have to share. It doesn't have to be, you know, parceled out between people and um, filter between other people's truths and you know and it just was that free expression for me and um, I always really I still do like really thrive in that kind of atmosphere and um, you know found myself in in my own way too like going through some of those um, archetypes that he, uh, that artists go through you know to to find their true to to be you know true to themselves and to the art that they're creating and their point of view. And I always feel like Reiki really strengthened that for me, you know? Um, and uh, Reiki has, has always been a support for me to, to do my work, you know, and how I choose to show up, um, you know, both professionally, but also just as a person. And um, <clears throat> some of the ways that Reiki really supports me in that is just like helping me, um, kind of find my center in the creative process because a creative process can be really fragmenting I think in many ways like um you know like you might put all of your time and energy into a project or a book or you know a, a course and then you know lo and behold you go through that whole process of creating something all the way through to completing it and then you're right back at the creation stage again and that always, that moment always is a little discombobulating for me. And that's when I really feel like I need to lean into Reiki more than anything. Um, and some of it is a lot of, you know, I think the, the struggle of the artist is like, you know, you can't necessarily just like clock in to work and be like, okay, I'm ready to create now. You know, like it's actually like, it comes when it comes, it's there with the inspirations there when it's there. And so Kind of learning to trust that process has been also something that I feel like Reiki has really supported me in. Um, and so like today, I kind of had one of those moments where most of my day was just totally disorganized, like had a certain idea of what it was going to be. And ultimately, it's a Monday that today that we're filming and um, 
sometimes I, t- I call Mondays moon days because they're just days where I can't like go out of the gate running. I have to actually really sit in my self and in my process and reconnect to my vision of whether it be what I want to create for the week or what I'm creating globally and, and, and kind of sit and listen into life, feel that spark of inspiration really push me into that next. It's not so often logical step forward, although I do like to use logic in the process, but sometimes it's just this, that more intuitive step forward where, where's that space where, where is uh, the spirit or this energy guiding me into? And, um, so that, that process can look like, you know, a lot of meditation, sitting in the sunlight for a period of time, or just de- doing some breathing or embodiment exercises until I feel like that sense of groundedness that, or that connection to a bigger vision. And then from there, um, that's when all the magic happens for me. And yeah. um, there's been times where I feel like I can get lost in that <laughs> little kind of a dark space before the light comes in. And, but I've learned to trust the process. And so that's one thing I'm really grateful for. Well, and you're, you're speaking at least a little bit to the idea of there being creative cycles and Bronwyn, you know, when you were talking about, um, like these words that I'm saying are brand new, but then they're not because people have said the same words, said the same phrases, but the context is new, right? It, you know, there was this, this interplay that happened for me when you were talking about that between, um, the pattern of speech, the pattern of repeated phrases, the pattern of repeated words and gestures, um, that gets repeated over and over and over again in a you know large group of people, um, and then the uniqueness of each expression, and the way that that connects with the patterns of the world, right? The cycles of life, the cycles of the seasons, the cycles of decomposing and growing new life, the cycles of you know going from uh, spring to summer to fall to winter. You know, you're going into winter while we're coming into summer because we're on opposite ends of the of the you know the globe. And, you know, there's just this, um, there's something that feels like it's an expression of what Reiki is in that, in the, the, the firmness of the pattern and the cycle and the predictability of it and the, the trustability of it and the way that we can feel it inside of ourselves and our bodies and our spirits in our communication, our language, but also the, the freedom inside of that predictability to innovate, to follow our impulses and our intuition, to create something new in each moment inside of the structure of the patterns. And when we think about that map that we work with in Reiki between the Hara, the head and the heart, the earth, the heavens and the centered place between them, you know, we see that, we see this pattern, this very predictable cycle, um, very simple, very straightforward um, and inside of that endless innovation that can happen. And there's something really powerful about settling into the structure, settling into that cycle, the pattern that then frees up that creative energy. And um, as you were speaking about that and referencing the three diamonds and of, um, you know, earth, heaven, and, and the centered place in between how to head and heart, uh, I was thinking back to the Reiki practitioner circle that I hosted this uh, weekend. And we did just a very simple three diamonds practice, just working with a partner. We had some people online who were doing self-practice and just a, a particular way of being with those three points in that sequence um, with each other. And just extremely simple, just very, very simple pattern. We've been working with these same points, you know, over and over again for years. You know, these are folks I've been working with for years. And as we went through this practice several times, each time people innovated inside of it, right? It was the same practice. It was the same three points. It was the same map. It was the same pattern, the same structure, but you know, someone chose to lie down and do it from a horizontal position. Somebody chose to work with a plant instead of another person and connect with the plant's literal roots and its literal reaching branches. Um, and there were just various other innovations that people came up with. And, you know, so it really had, had me thinking about what is this interplay between our creative nature and the structures that hold us and connect us and with Reiki. And it just, it just felt like there was something there between the firmness of having a structure, having a pattern and the flexibility, the creativity that happens when we rest and relax into that pattern, right? And that the innovation can come. 
And when we tell ourselves that we're not creative or we believe that, or we've been told that by our parents or by society or by our teachers, by the way that certain people are privileged and seen as creative and other people are dismissed. When we walk around believing that about ourselves, then we miss those moments of innovation. And an exercise like that, very simple, repeated practice, which is like, how many things like that do we do in a day? Simple, basic, repeated practice that we do over and over again, whether it's Reiki or something else. But we miss those moments of innovation and creativity. We miss that moment where a particular sound happens that we haven't heard before because we you know, brushed something against something else in, an, in a way that was, was delightful. Um, and this, all of these moments that can become this, this symphony, this interplay between our own little individual self and this vast web of life that we're, that we're part of, that we're one point on it. You know, I feel like choosing to express our creativity in those moments, choosing to lean into it inside the structure of our day is how we, we sing with life. It's how we um, remind ourselves that we're part of something bigger. It's, it's like our creativity is part of the vehicle through which we remember our interconnection with life because we can be held in that structure and at the same time express what's, what's particular about, a, about this moment, about our own experience. And there's something really just delightful in that. And it's part of why it's been so powerful and meaningful for me to direct my teaching and my practice to how do we integrate Reiki into our day to day? How do we integrate this practice into every single moment, no matter what we're doing? Yeah. Right. Because in that way, these moments become salient for us. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I mean, there's so much in, in, in all of that. Uh, I wanted to write notes, but there's too many notes. So, you know, uh, but it did, did, bring me about to thinking about Makau Sui and how, you know, people talk about uh, on the memorial stone in um, Tokyo is, you know, his, his uh, life story is, has been written there by the um, association in Japan. And, uh, you know, it talks about how he spontaneously sort of came up with, um, uh, you know, some of the teachings and spontaneity is a creative thing obviously but how how are we spontaneous and we are spontaneous because of something that both of you have talked about which is process you know it's that structure and it's that working through things with things until there's a point where something spontaneously comes from that so it's not like spontaneity uh, is something that doesn't have a have a base, have a foundation. And um, Carrie, you talked about grounding, for example, you know, and I think that's a imp very important part of anything that is creative, uh, that the, it, it gives form and um, structure to, to everything that we think and do and how we do that. And mm -hmm. so spontaneity needs... Uh, how do you say that? It needs work in a way, yeah? And we can see that uh, in the precepts as well, or a lot of these things that we've been talking about. So um, one of them, you know, um, for today only, you know, it is what I was sort of talking about before, which is just, um, just being here and, and really being here. And so then we're tapping into a wealth of, you know, past, present, future, and it's all here. So it's like this you know, bowl of, of goodies to, to, to roll in. Yeah. And, <laughs> uh, and that can, you know, from that, what comes out, well, this is coming out. Right. And uh, so um, and, and, you know, we were talking about being true to your way. So, you know, the mission, what, what's your purpose? Yeah. What's the mission that comes out of that? And to have a strong mission, we need that grounding. We need to, to have focus and also being diligent. So working hard, keeping to the, doing the work, because from that work, 
then we have all those beautiful goodies to to uh, work with with clarity and uh, you know there's so much like I said that that um, that came out of what you guys were just saying and trusting the process I think that was really important so you know a lot of that is that being here now so not being scattered and all over the place allowing yourself to to focus be here and know that it's okay and yeah. and, and what comes out of that mm. there was something you said earlier Bronwyn about um creativity rather than being about the ego and about the I and asserting that, um, you know, capital I self, rather it's, it possibly is the opposite about, about releasing the attachment to the I and, and connecting with something larger. And that like, I'd never thought about it in those terms, but it felt extremely true. And it really kind of shined a light on those earlier experiences I was talking about, where I was really efforting to become an artist and, you know, make my, my profession, you know, as an artist and, and just the struggle of that and being inherently creative, but like not being able to make that work. And I feel like a part of that was holding this goal, this desire that I had in the context of I'm going to, I'm going to be somebody, right. It was, it was so ego driven. It was so much about needing acknowledgement and needing to be recognized and needing to be seen as good and valuable. And that's reflected in the way that our culture holds art making. Again, that there's, it's a privileged status. Mm -hmm. Only certain people are allowed to do it and be rewarded and acknowledged for it. And everyone else is just, you know, you have a hobby if you do something creative. That's a hobby. It's not your work, right? And we put this division on it and it, it guarantees that we approach, well, it sets the conditions for it to be very likely that we approach our creativity as an ego-driven endeavor, as opposed to something that allows us to feel that connection with the web of life and to feel something bigger than ourselves that we're contributing to or contributing our uniqueness to, but that isn't about us, right? It isn't about that, you know, acknowledgement of being that singular creator. Um, it's about being part of a creative energy that's, that's, inherent in all of life. And it just makes me, you know, wonder what would be different if that's how we approached the concept of creativity and art making as a culture, as opposed to this very um, hierarchical, you know, capitalist like perspective, ego-driven perspective on what is valuable as, as art making. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a personal thing, right? Yeah rather than a corporate thing or a, yeah, yeah. And it's a thing that connects us, right? Inherently can connect us when we're approaching it from this, this other way that we've been speaking as opposed to this, you know, singularity of the artist. Um, and that's not to say that people shouldn't be acknowledged for being brilliant, you know, as, as artists, um, but that that's not all that there is, right? That again, every single one of us uh, has the capacity for creativity, for vast amounts of creativity. Um, and oftentimes it shows itself in ways that just aren't acknowledged um, or recognized. And when they look back at like cavemen and things like that, cave women, <laughs> you know, that they, they find that they're always so amazed when they're like, oh, wow, they were doing that <laughs> creative, not, not to, you know, barter with or to whatever, you know, they were doing they it. wanted it to be pretty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Concept of beauty. Mm. I think it's so true. And I think um, just as you were speaking, Michaela, I just had that big realization. And I, I, I had a, um, a client once who, you know, spent his, his whole life in a really um, kind of uh, left brain create a job, you know, very left brain, you know, but uh, always had that sense that he had this art inside of him that wanted to express and he had to wait all the way until he retired. And now he's kind of really brought in all of his spirituality, uh, his artist side and um, his healer side as well in, in that process. And, and I, I think that's what's such a disservice, you know, um, to some of the way that our um artistry is framed as like a right brain, left brain type of person. And I'm somebody who has both. I have, you know, a degree in, um, in science and, and then also just have this really creative, uh, 
right side brain archetype too. And I think that's some part of coming into this place of wholeness and, and what a different world we would live in if we didn't have to compartmentalize our artist, our creative self, our spiritual self out of the work that we do. And um, I think that that's one of the joys of being a Reiki practitioner is that you get to weave all of those aspects of you into your work. And um, I think also going back to one thing that Bronwyn said is that, you know, there's this openness and this cleanness and this spaciousness inside of, you know, earth, sky, heart connection. And I think that's also too, for me, one of the things that really supports me as an artist is kind of getting into that cleaner space. And when I feel like my inner world is cluttered um, or even just, you know, kind of the, the clutteredness that can happen in spiritual spaces, it's like, you know, and what Michaela, you were speaking to is like, oh, this very simple exercise that you come back to again and again. And I think those are so profound for people. And what's hard is to be like, okay, let's do three diamonds this week and seven chakras next week. And this, you know, and then this and this and this, and just kind of constantly layering on different ways of looking at spirituality within spiritual spaces. Sometimes that can clutter up, you know, our, um, our spiritual space. And so, I love that, you know, I think, especially within, I've noticed within teaching yoga is that people need that clean space. They need not a, a chaotic, you know, disconnected yoga class, but something that's really deeply interconnected, yeah. moving logically towards something or moving in within the spirit of something. Okay. And when we can really anchor our mind to one thing, or a small, you know, progression of something that's not too complicated, that, that also just really sets ourselves up for the appropriate space to be connecting to spiritual energy. Because if we're just like kind of coming at it, grasping at straws for all of these different things, and believe me, I'm saying this because I know <laughs> I've experienced this, I've tried this, is that it just leads to just kind of this more chaotic spiritual connection you know and so um that's one thing that i do really really have found to love about reiki is the simplicity of it and coming back all the way to that openness that clean space um and i think that for me i mean i you know and i'd say that so many artists have different point of views i have this puzzle that i'm working on right now and this is one thing that i love to do for my mind like scatter up a thousand pieces and put them back together again that's very cathartic for me um, but the puzzle is this like amazing rendition of a dragon and, mm -hmm. and like any little point you see in, in the puzzle, there's something unique and different and doing it as a puzzle, you can actually, you know, if you just saw it on a wall, you'd be like, oh, wow, like there's a dragon, you know, but like looking so deeply at the intricacies of this particular piece of art. So I guess I want to say that artists can go both ways. <laughs> they can come from that very simple place, but sometimes art is so immensely complex and with these deep, deep layers. Um, but I think when you do that kind of work, it really does um, require you to come from that one singular point of view ultimately and, and build from there. Mm. There is a Japanese term which um, you might know, ikigai. There's a couple of um, books about it um, in English um, and it's, I've just got the little definition here, but it, it's be true to your way, living with passion and purpose without ego. So it's about working with passion, having a mission and, um, and, and a purpose. So it, it's pretty much, um, so that's, that's, it's an, a way of being, a way of living, yeah. And I know we talk about the precepts, and I guess you could see that as another sort of way of of seeing the precepts. Mm -hmm. um, but that it's sort of, you know, when you're talking about being creative and being an artist, and and how we do that. So you know, being that really truthful to ourselves, and but having that spark of passion, and and knowing where we're going, you know. So um, having a very true purpose, without it being, as you were saying, Michaela, without that the being ego driven yeah and I, I think that's a it's quite 
you know, the Japanese are very good at making those beautiful, simple statements. And uh, I quite like that. And I think that um, it, it's, it, it's like the way of living as an artist. And there's something that both of you have. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's something both of you have been speaking to um, that's been incorporated into what you've been saying, which is around our relationship to beauty. Right. And when I think about like what you just named the, the Japanese way of um, simply rendering something, whether it's a, a word, a statement, a, an image, a flower arrangement, a movement, um, that there's this way in which there is uh, it's, it's an exquisite thing because not only of the communication of something important, but because of the beauty inside of it. And you know, humans, we have this inherent relationship to beauty. Uh, we seek it, we, we surround ourselves with it in whatever way we define it, right? It's gonna look different for everybody. It's gonna feel different for everybody. Um, but oftentimes there's some element of seeking out patterns, seeking out um, structures and fluidity, however that looks, however it feels. And that our relationship to beauty is a huge part of how we navigate the world. We move towards it. We move away from things that don't feel like they have it, right? Um, and we look for it. You know, I mean, I can think of driving through, you know, parts of town that are that are run down or that you know don't have any of the markers that I would normally generically describe as beautiful, like lots of trees or art, um, and just finding absolute exquisite beauty in the curve of a, of a freeway arch, right? The way it crosses each other, the maze of, of different freeways coming together and just finding those patterns. It's like, wherever we are, we're seeking it. Mm -hmm. And we, we apply it medicinally, you know? I mean, people, um, you know, I, I have a lot of friends who are, are therapists or counselors, and, you know, we talk a lot about the way that they set up their space, you know, that, that emphasizes in subtle ways, um, points of beauty and often using the act of seeking beauty as a therapeutic tool, right? To invite people to find something that anchors them because they find it beautiful. Um, and so I, I feel like that's, that's part of this conversation. Um, it's, it's, it's also its own conversation, but this relationship to beauty is one that um, I found it really valuable to emphasize with people bring to people's attention to really integrate into whatever it is that I'm teaching or whatever it is I'm practicing, because it has a real physiological impact on us when we relate to something beautiful, whether it's a sound, a sight, something that tastes really amazing, right? Anything that stimulates our, any of our senses in a way that we identify as beautiful has this, this healing quality and it has this connecting quality, right? We feel more connected to whatever it is that's happening when we sense something beautiful in the room. And that's been a really powerful um, like stimulus to bring into Reiki teaching and Reiki practice because of the way that it, it can anchor us and connect us. Uh, so I really invite people, you know, even just now, like the three of us and anybody listening to this, like just take a moment and look around your environment and just let yourself or, or, you know, listen, like use one of your senses to reach out into your space and just find something that you perceive as beautiful. And let's just, let's just spontaneously right now, just take like five seconds and just rest our attention on that thing. All right. Will you do that with me? Okay. So just find something in your space that just for whatever reason strikes you as beautiful. And let's just take five minutes to five minutes, five seconds, just uh, holding our attention there. Just notice what happens inside of yourself. So that was that was five seconds. Yeah, I was thinking yeah. about the repeating pattern that you were talking about, Michaela. And even as you were talking, I was thinking of something in my environment. But and but I mean, how much that expands out into other things. But the this. That's, you know, we talked about structure and repeated patterns being structure and how that gives us stability 
So it gives us grounding, but it also gives us something to move from. And that's that, you know, creative spontaneousness. And I was thinking of the labyrinth that I've got here okay. made of plants, right? And how that structure, people are attracted to that. It's a 3000 year old design, yeah. And how people, when they see that, you know, I think everyone connects in some way with that. And if I look at the actual design of that, I always say that to me, it looks like a brain. And so it's, you know, it's like, it, and, and mm -hmm. some people think of it as a womb and, you know, everybody's sort of got different takes on it, but it's things that we connect to and that we see perhaps a part of ourselves or, yeah, it's interesting how, uh, and then I was thinking about doodling, you know, like when you doodle, how you always do, I'm sure everyone does the same thing. You do similar patterns and how those patterns mean something to you in some way, you know, and it's a creative thing that we're expressing something, but something that I feel is grounding and, and yet at the same time is free flowing. So it has these, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it was so lovely to chat with you ladies today about a very kind of unique adaptation, right, of being true to our way and linking it into creativity. But um, I know that this conversation will keep me, my creative juices going throughout the week and probably well beyond today. So thank you so much for that. Can I give a little poem? I had a little poem. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh. We should not stifle the creative process, of course, Bronwyn. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, it's not my poem. I didn't write it. But hey, okay. It's a Japanese poem by, you know, Basho, who is, is a famous um, Japanese poet. And I have a book. Oh, cool. <laughs> and it, it actually talks to, um, I think Carrie may have been talking about that, just about a bit about the clutteredness you know like mm. in life when it's so cluttered and um so when we release that clutter and we have that freedom and what comes from that you know so you know if, if you have oh here we go i knew i'd have something around you know if you have something like this and it's i'm not sure this will work but no that doesn't work but the you know, when you have a bell and you, you do that and it has the vibration because it's empty. Yes, excuse the coffee cup there. And so, you know, that it's empty and, and when you hit it and it has this beautiful vibration, but when you got all the crap in it, yeah, and it's totally cluttered and you hit it, no vibration, yeah. And so it's that living in that vibration and, and that's when, when we talk about that openness and that boundlessness and what potential can arise from that. So his poem is this, the temple bell stops, but the sound keeps coming out of the flowers. interconnection when the temple bell stops and the sound keeps coming out of the flowers and the bell and the flowers are interconnected and we listening and feeling are interconnected yeah that's so beautiful yeah and it's like that whole the you know what what we do affects everybody and everything yeah and so if our vibration is that beautiful clear uncluttered um clean vibration yeah, that how it affects everyone and everything around us. I mean, there's so much, so much to that, but it's beautiful, I thought. So, hmm. Love it. Well, I'll be pondering these beautiful words and these conversations well through the week. And I hope all of you who are listening will also be pondering these things and maybe share with us some of your creative process, your favorite poetry, your favorite Reiki moment or something that just felt so inspiring and creative that came to you through Reiki. We would love to hear more about that. And if you know of a creative type in your life who uses Reiki, might, might as well share this episode of Reiki Women to them. They might really appreciate it and um, enjoy the support of others who, you know, live this creative life and would Press live like this creative life. Press, Press the like button. button. Press the like. Share a comment. 
<laughs> we love that. And that does so much for our podcast in terms of getting it to more people. Um, so any support that you have, you want to throw it our way. Well, we appreciate that and appreciate you. And um, until we see you again, happy creating and have a lot of joy with your Reiki practice. Um, we'll be seeing you next week. All right. Bye, everyone.